The trilogy of matches between Zack Sabre Jr. and Jonathan Gresham from mid-2016 are some of the absolute best US independent matches of the past decade. In fact, you'd be hard-pressed to find better matches than their third from that year's American Rana, a 2 out of 3 falls classic that has been unfairly swept under the rug by the grander pro wrestling narrative. Seriously, if you haven't yet, go out of your way to watch all three of these matches. They're available on independentwrestling.tv right now. As easy as it would have been for those two to just go out and pump out a series of fun technical bouts to garner praise from a hardcore wrestling fandom, there is an element to these matches that separates them from other great indie classics. And that element is generosity. Professional wrestling is an ironic art form in that its main goal is to portray and simulate combat, but that can only be properly achieved with full cooperation from the participants. At least, you know, ideally. That cooperation involved in the structured and narrative nature of professional wrestling means that a generous give and take from one performer to another is just as important in wrestling, if not more so, than other similar performance arts like stage acting or improvisation. And in pro wrestling, generosity displays itself most prominently via one of my favorite discussion points on this channel, selling. The depiction of pain, vulnerability, and weakness that layers in all the best kinds of drama in most pro wrestling matches. And for my money, few wrestling performances have been as giving and generous as Zack Sabre Jr.'s in this three-match series against Jonathan Gresham. Their first match from Ripped Off in the Prime of Life starts out in the vein of what you'd expect from two world-class technical wrestlers. There's a lot of back and forth exchanges on the mat as each man seeks an opening to try and gain the advantage on their opponent. It's sportsmanlike, friendly competition between two friends who have trained all over the world to become masters of their craft. Though at first, both men seem evenly matched, the close look shows that Gresham might have an advantage over Zack as they grapple. Gresham successfully escapes most of Zack's attempts to lock him down, he's able to maintain control over Zack on multiple occasions, never quite being overwhelmed. Even when Zack is able to slip out of Gresham's grasp, you never get the sense that it's because Zack outworked him on the mat, but rather that he just escaped by the skin of his teeth. In fact, Zack gets so frustrated by how skilled Gresham is on the mat that he throws the first strike in this match, escalating the action in the ring. While Gresham gamely strikes back, Zack does seem to have the more effective strikes, kicking in his opponent's arm. The fact that Zack throws the first blow is a concession on his part that he's been technically outdone and that he could only regain control by resorting to more violent actions. The whole match is structured to put in the viewer's mind that Gresham just might be a better technical wrestler than Zack Sabre Jr. In their second match at Beyond Wrestling's Flesh, Zack Sabre Jr. kicks things off looking much more in control. He spends a significant portion of the opening working over Gresham's arm and even countering Gresham's escape attempts. Even when Gresham utilizes his speed and some high flying to try and halt Sabre, Zack is able to remain cool and stay in control. The intensity between these two really starts to up itself in this match when both men start attacking each other's arms. Where much of their first match was all about exhibitionary displays of control, their submission and limb work in this match definitely feels far more violent and brutal. In fact, in the latter half of the match, both men are shown heavily selling their arms, holding them limp and close to their bodies. Both Zack and Gresham have proved themselves to be so closely matched on the mat that both start relying on throwing big strikes and bombs towards the end. Zack finds himself on the receiving end of the brunt of the big bombs, taking a German suplex from Gresham and even a Hurricane Rana off the top rope. But even as Zack gives back as good as he gets when he's in control, he brilliantly sells the damage to his arm to put over just how effectively Gresham's attack tore him down. 
By the time we get to their third and final match, a 2 out of 3 falls match in the main event of Beyond American Rana, things have heated up to a fever pitch between these two men. Where their quick, fast-paced grappling was competitive in spirit in the first match, now there's a definite sense of frustration from both men. They want to put away their opponent and prove their superiority. A sportsmanly competition has become deeply personal and fiery. It's a struggle for the referee just to separate them on a rope break. And somehow, these two manage to make a series of hip toss attempts look both gritty and high stakes. Hip toss attempts, guys. An attempt from Gresham to springboard off the second rope gives Zack an opening to kick out his opponent's leg and send him crashing onto his neck, a weakness that Zack is quick to exploit. Gresham displays his own abilities for strong selling in this segment, really putting over how damaged his neck is from Saber's onslaught. This is of course complemented by Zack's excellent ability to target a body part with brutality. In the final fall of the match, Gresham is able to nail a low dropkick to Zack's knee to kick off an attack of the leg. Gresham matches Zack in brutality, using his full arsenal of strikes and holds in an attempt to rip Zack's leg from his body. Zack audibly yells in pain as Gresham wrenches his ankle and even pulls his kick pad down to relieve the pressure from a swelling limb. Some of the offense Gresham applies to Zack's leg make me physically cringe even on rewatch. Zack's selling only adds to the drama of the match as his pain comes through clear as day through the entirety of the final fall. You can almost feel the ache in his legs. Even as he fights from underneath to try and stop Gresham, it's evident that his leg is giving him trouble and that he might be just one submission away from losing the match. It is a stunning performance, one of the best individual performances from any wrestler in all of the 2010s. Now I've dedicated a lot of this essay to discussing how great Zack's performances in these matches have been, especially in relation to generosity and selling. That's not at all to say that Gresham does not give his own share in these matches. In the second and third matches in particular, he also puts in great selling performances when Zack is able to pick apart one of his body parts. Gresham is not at all a bad performer here, and he matches Zack's intensity and displays the appropriate amounts of vulnerability when needed. So why do I focus on Zack? Because in terms of credibility, Zack had much more to lose than Gresham did at this point in his career. Yes, Gresham was a well-beloved and respected technician with some decent exposure on the American indies, but he was miles and miles away from where Zack Sabre Jr. was. In 2016, Zack Sabre Jr. was PWG World Champion, even as these matches were happening. He was on WWE programming as a semi-finalist in the Cruiserweight Classic. He had just begun his bookings under New Japan Pro Wrestling, and he dominated the British independent scene. Zack Sabre Jr. was on top of his game as one of the most skilled and talented professional wrestlers in the world. So it says a lot to Zack Sabre Jr.'s willingness to transfer some of that credibility to Gresham by selling so hard for him in these three matches. It says even more that Zack Sabre Jr. lost every single fall to Jonathan Gresham. Oh yeah, the first match he loses via crucifix pin. In the second, he submits to the octopus hold. In their final match, Gresham and Zack draw in the first fall in a double pinfall attempt before Zack taps out to a figure four leg lock in the final. It would have been easy for Zack Sabre Jr. to refuse any of these losses. He had the position and the sway to do so as the world champion of a major independent company, as well as someone being featured on WWE programming. Instead, he loses three matches straight, never once having a decisive victory over Jonathan Gresham. I love this series of matches. The wrestling in it is, of course, 
world class. That's to be expected from Jonathan Gresham and Zack Sabre Jr. But the progression of Zack's frustration and his desperation as he goes on to lose every single fall to Jonathan Gresham is what really takes these matches over the top. They're a fantastic mix of brilliant ring work, unexpected results, and escalating stakes. It's a perfect display of how generosity in wrestling can benefit all involved. If you want to hear more about the Gresham Saber trilogy of matches, I highly recommend checking out the first ever episode of the Psychology is Dead podcast, where they break down all three matches in even greater detail. It's a wonderful listen if you enjoyed these matches and want to go over some of the smaller moments that allow the action to culminate the way that it does. Thank you all so much for watching. If you guys like this video and you want to support the channel, consider buying me a coffee over at coffee.com slash Joseph Montesilio. Come talk wrestling with me on Twitter. That's at Joseph Weirdness. You guys have been absolutely great. Thank you so much for tuning in and have a good one.